Good morning, church family. My finest of friends. If you lost something last Saturday night out here in the front of a certain value, please get up with Miss Tess. Where's Miss Tess? So that you don't, may not know. I can't see. If you don't know who Miss Tess is and you lost something of value, just get up with me and I'll direct you to her. Speaking of things that's been lost, of great value to Christianity is our topic today. It's been lost, and we're going to revive it, but not until we've asked God to bless. Our Father in heaven, it is a wonderful thing to stop our world and be able to hear you through your word. May you bless our desire to know what you have to say to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and ask for the portion of your spirit. Amen. We left off when we, was, we were in this book, Steps to Christ, as a study tool to look at all the gospel aspects, to really make sure we're not missing one. And, you know, for years and years of studying the book, Steps to Christ, chapter 4, Confession, is one of those chapters that you just blip right through. It's short, and you're like, okay, confession, I get it. And if you don't understand confession, your repentance is um, not complete. You can't have an effective repentance without confession and that's what we're going to look at and without an effective complete repentance you have no salvation and so that's how important our topic is today repentance is really the the inward working and confession is the outward expression of it and so you, there must be this this outward expression that we're going to be speaking about um, the world lost the idea of confession, or it really got worried, watered down over the centuries with this phrase, ego te absolvo, right? I, I forgive you. In Rome, and during the medieval ages, when, when the idea of confession got watered down to something that a priest would command over you after showing you what you have to do for penance, the works that you got to perform, and then you come into the booth and you say, uh, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, and then ego te absolvo, do this, and you're good. And over the centuries, confession kind of got watered down to just something you say to another man, and then that's it, and you're good, and that actually became the whole of what repentance was. Today we're going to look at what does the Bible say about repentance. Proverbs 28 verse 13 is the Old Testament place that we'll go to. He who covers his sins, now think about this, this is how biblical constructs work. So the idea is he who covers his sins, so how do you not cover your sin? He, who that cover, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confession is like one of the central themes of the gospel. And we're going to get right into chapter 4 of Steps to Christ with this quote about confession. The conditions of obtaining mercy of God are simple and just and reasonable. The Lord does not require us to do some grievous thing in order that we may have the forgiveness of sin. We need not make long and wearisome pilgrimages or perform painful penances to commend our souls to the God of heaven or to expiate our transgression. But he that confess and he that forsakes his sins shall have mercy. Confess your sins to God who only can forgive them and your faults to one another. So we're going to look at this. Confession has two arms, confession to God and confession to really, or your faults, it doesn't say confession, one to another. So all the hard work has really already been done. In the book Steps to Christ, these first three chapters are bringing out the work of the gospel. The rough stuff's been done. And Jesus actually performed the rough stuff 2,000 years ago. That was chapter 1 that we went over, right? We looked at the cross, and we looked at what he has done in our behalf. Then our job was to come to him 
And we looked at what that meant, what it means to follow him, to become a disciple of his, what we're going to accept. And when we step up in line and say, yes, we are going to follow you, we're coming to you, then God's job was to bring conviction. And then when we accepted conviction, then repentance came. That true, like, like I heartfelt condition where we're like, okay, I see my sin and I accept that. And the Holy Spirit comes as a result of that. Today is the next step. Confession is a vital part of that. God wants to hear something come out of your heart, through your lips and into his, to his ears Confession is vital because really it's entering. It's like entering a plea of guilty, right? We talk about courtroom scenes all the time. Well, there's a courtroom scene going on in the heaven. In fact, the entire human race has been indicted by God as transgressors against his law, treasonous against his kingdom. And when we have confession, the real idea of confession, the Old Testament idea is really to enter on my behalf the plea as guilty as charged. It is saying yes and true and amen to what the Holy Spirit through repentance has shown me. Whether it's something that I'm doing that God doesn't want me to do, or it's something that he wants me to do that I haven't been doing. And when we confess, we are, we are saying to God, this is a true statement about myself. And the reason why we can do this is because we have an advocate, right? We can confess. We shouldn't be afraid. You know, today, confession, the first thing most of us do, at least myself, the first thing I do when, when a charge is brought against me by my wife <laughs> is the first thing is a defense. I'm like, no, 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 I didn't do that. When, when, when brought up before my leaders up at the conference, the first thing to do is to defend. We all do that because we're afraid of consequences. We're afraid of what's going to happen if I am seen as wrong or guilty. And it is like just innate within the human soul and psyche to the first thing is to say, nope. But we don't have to do that with God because the Bible tells us that we have a great heavenly high priest. We have one that ministers for us in the sanctuary. It's why the Seventh-day Adventist Church spends so much time teaching about the sanctuary in heaven. Because when Jesus left this earth, the Bible tells us he went and he sat down in that sanctuary above and there to receive our repentance. But how does he receive that repentance? What is the mechanism whereby he can take you the sin from you and place it on himself? This is where confession. In the Old Testament, this will make sense to you once you put two and two together. In the Old Testament, they had two, daily, two services, right? The daily service of the morning and the evening service. And then any time in between, if you come under the conviction of sin, something that you had done, you went straight to the tabernacle. So if you had sinned that night... First thing in the morning, you're at the morning service, you are confessing your sin. The same thing at night. If you had done something wrong during the day, do not go to bed without confessing and going to the temple. Or any time during the day, you could go in there and you would bring your animal, your sacrifice, your substitutionary atonement, you would bring it in and you would do what? Do you remember what you did? We, we usually say you transfer the sin to the animal, but particularly they confessed their sin over the head of they lay their hands on that sacrifice and they confessed that sin. And only when they confessed with their lips their guilt, then the sin was transferred to the lamb, which then ends up transferring to the courtyard and then to eventually to the veil of the sanctuary there to be expunged on the great day of atonement and those carmine droplets of blood those little red droplets of blood were a record of the confession of your sin right so when i confessed on that animal his blood was a was a courtroom document actually picturing something else above it was a it was a record that the sin was no longer on Curtis Damon's knee he confessed his guilt and the animal bore it and that's the record of it that's how it works in the sanctuary above this is why Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 through 22 says this 
It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This is why you can confess. Because you have been given a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Right? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He is saying, Paul is saying, look, we have a high priest. And when you confess like you did here on earth in the Old Testament, you have a high priest that is promised to take that confession as a profession of your faith in him, and he will take that and remove that sin from you. Confession has to take place. Without confession, repentance is incomplete and therefore null and void. Without confession, sin remains still inward, and you have not transferred it to the temple above. And it's a very language that steps to Christ that the third paragraph of chapter 4 says. Then you are to seek the forgiveness of God because the brethren you have wounded is the property of God and in injuring him you have sinned against his creator and redeemer. Listen to this. The case is brought before the only true mediator, our great high priest. Now think about this. Now we're even talking about sins against God. This little section was about sin against your brother. And when you sin against your brother in word or deed, the case goes to the most high. <laughs> That's serious. He's the maker. He's the creator, the one that we wound. The people that we wound in our lives are the property of God. And when you wound them, you wound him. And he says, that comes to me. That case comes up before me. That sin comes up before me. And the process of confession, as we'll see in the stream of the gospel message, right? Coming to me, conviction, repentance, confession is how God says, ah, okay, we're good. So many are suffering under a load in this world from shame and guilt because they have not truly had real confession in their lives. Past mistakes, regrets, right? The things that we do, the world is suffering today because they do not understand the promise when one confesses that God will forgive and assurance will come. Freedom of the soul will happen if you learn to confess because confession ha has been dwindled down to some man in a dark closet with a black robe on saying, what is your sins? No one wants to go confess to another person. And the world has this very strange view when we say confess your sins, but God is saying, no, 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 no. The only man in the closet that you're going to confess to is the one up here. And you're going to come to me in this closet called the sanctuary. And if you will confess, then you will be set free from your shame and from your guilt and your regret and your troubles. I will give you and grant you mercy if I hear that come from your lips. And that's what the world needs to hear today. The world is groaning under shame and guilt and problems and mistakes that they have made in their lives. It has caused them trouble and sorrow, feeling cut off from God, cut off from man. They need to know that there is a process whereby when I confess it, it is gone from me. That is the mercy that God has promised to give to us. The stuff that we are talking about is freedom for the soul to operate in a new way in a new day. It's a freedom to come underneath a new power. That's why confession is so important. It's like one of these, like next to baptism, confession is the consistent thing that we should do in our lives to keep me in this state of freedom from the bondage. And psychological bondage is misery. Psychological bondage comes, whether you realize it or not, when we sin against God or against man, we come under our own psychological bondage. The world just doesn't know that because they've been lied to and told that it's just a guilty conscience or, or you're just feeling bad or you've been, you've been made to, to feel negative and it's critical, don't listen to it. But the Bible tells me when I sin against God and man, the Holy Spirit is not going to let me go. And they need to understand that what we really need is this act of confession that comes out of a real repentant life. Listen to this. If we have not experienced that repentance, which is not to, repent, to be repented of, and have not with true humiliation, soul, and brokenness of spirit 
confessed our sins, abhorring our iniquity, we have never truly sought for the forgiveness of sin. So in other words, that's Victorian language where things are a little bit backwards, but in other words, if there's not confession going on, then there's not real repentance. And then we're in trouble. We're in grave, terrible trouble. There is something psychologically healing in confession. Look, when, when I spent some time at Weimar University up there with Dr. Nedley, and, and even the world clinicians in psychology understand, you take God out of it, they understand the healing process that has to take place through confession. In ruptured relationships, especially in marriages, healing cannot take place until one confesses their wrong to the other. And almost instamatically, when confession takes place, healing is right there with it. I have had this experience. I, I mean, like, I've lived long enough to, to, to have heard a lot of people in my life and to understand how this works. I have been wounded and hurt by people, and, and you foster that feeling within you, that, that regret, that kind of anger. You think, oh, well, they forgot about it, but you don't really forget about what someone's done to you that's wrong. Not until that person comes to you. This one soul came to me and said, hey, man, look, man, I'm sorry. Instantly healing in the heart. The feeling of goodwill overcomes you. And what do you say? Well, what I say, oh, man, don't worry about it. It was no big deal, but it was a big deal. It was bothering me bad. Immediately that, that feeling of warmth and healing takes place when we confess in this way. Well, the time that I egregiously attacked a coworker with my words, and I can be sharp with my tongue, I can be ruthless with my words. And I, this coworker, I let him have it this day and cut him down to the quick and to the core and left him speechless, and I walked off and made jokes about it that afternoon. I didn't realize how damaging my words were. Until I come under the conviction, he had quit that job and left. And about a month later, I was like, God, I, I probably shouldn't have done that. The sermon the, that week the preacher had talked about was our tongue, a foul little thing. And I, and I said, well, Lord, I, I, I don't even know where he's at. He quit. He left the job. I started praying. Well, how can I make it right? And lo and behold, about three months later, he showed back up on the job site for one day before we fired him again. But in that one day, I went straight to him, and man, I, I, said, I came to him and said, Brother, the things that I said to you that day, they were horrendous. He says, You know what? I thought about taking my life that night. Because he was going through divorce, and I was making light of it and getting some laughter from my jokes. He says, Man, you pushed me near to the edge. And when I said, Brother, I, I'm telling you what, I apologize. That was the worst thing I've ever done. I am so sorry. And as I was apologizing to him, I started to weep. I just, tears started flowing down my face because what I didn't realize and wounded him in down some weird psychological way, my own heart was wounded over that sin. And when I confessed it to him, I started to weep. And a smile came over his face. We hugged. That's healing. That's confession. That's the point and purpose of it. When you confess like this, there's amazing things can happen in our relationships with one another, but especially with God. And we see this in the story of David. In 2 Samuel, you know the story well, at least I think most of you do. If not, you can read it for yourself one day somewhere in more thoroughly. But for now, Samuel, in 2 Samuel, David has come to the zenith, the pinnacle of his career. He was sitting on the rooftop. He saw a beautiful young woman, and the story goes. He he ended up having an affair with her. She, she became pregnant through this affair. And, and her husband, he didn't want her to find out, so he sent his husband to a certain death. And, and a year had passed by. He took this woman to be his wife. She was now pregnant. It was eight or nine months into it. And David was doing what Proverbs said. He was covering his sin. He's like, oh, well, you know, no harm, no foul. No one really knows what's going on. Nathan the prophet shows up with a parable from the Lord about a man, and a rich man and a poor man, one man with one little lamb, and the one little lamb was like a daughter to him. 
And the rich man had tons and thousands and thousands of sheep, and a wayfarer was coming. And in order to feed him, he didn't want to take his thousands of sheep. He went to the man's little lamb daughter, took it, butchered it, killed it, and ate it. Well, you know David. He's outraged. He said the man is worthy of death, and he should repay fourfold. And then Nathan said to him in verse 7, Chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Whew. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anoint you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. In other words, this is how you repay me. I delivered your life, and you delivered the life of my servant to death. He's coming under indictment. He's coming under condemnation. And now we're going to look at the gospel as in this story, a picture of how the atonement works, a picture of the sanctuary and the judgment that's going on above. It's all played out right here. And this is where confession comes in, our understanding of the sanctuary gospel. In verse 12, when David hears this, God then says to him, For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel before the sun, before the world. For the next 3,500 years, the world is going to know what you did. And that is the picture of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. For God will bring everything into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. No one gets away with nothing. Not one slight, simple, cutting word does it escape God's ears when we hurt and wound someone else. So God has given us this mechanism whereby we can come alive and get rid of this stuff in our lives. And David is a picture of what happens when we do because David's relationship with God was broken. I am sure that he had to have some kind of repentance going on in these nine, ten months. But it's not until verse 13 until David confesses that everything changes. In verse 13, so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, so right, right here, it's just that quick. David finally gets it. The, the indictment's been laid down. The story said all that it had to say. And David then right there publicly in front of everyone says, I have sinned against God. And Nathan's next word, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Immediately, God's like, wait, David, David, David. There you go. I forgive you. You're not going to die. That's why we can always confess. But then something interesting, the picture of righteousness by faith comes flooding in. The idea of the gospel now, that he confesses his sin. So he's been under repentance, right? He's been under conviction and condemnation. He confesses. God says, I forgive you. And then in verse 20, right, he does something strange. He says in verse 20, So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. There's a picture of our cleanness before God. When we confess, then we can be clothed in Christ's righteousness. Now we can worship before him of whole heart. It was a heinous thing that he did, but the moment that he confessed, God says, Now you can be in my presence. Now you can worship me with a true heart. But the story is not over because verse 24 is even better because, listen to this. You've got to grab this. Verse 24 says this. It says, Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son and called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. In other words, sin fractures our relationship with God. When we sin against one another, it fractures my relationship with God. And if we want to heal God's heart, if that can be a thing, but surely God is wounded when we sin. Didn't Jesus say, for I was wounded in the house of my friends? Didn't God say that my heart is churned within me over you? And so when we live sinful lives or we do sinful things every now and then, God also needs to have a healing moment with us. And we see that the moment we confess, God then forgives, washes, cleanses, and loves. He's able to say, okay. And God is able to move on. In fifth paragraph of Steps to Christ, chapter 4, a true confession, therefore, Think about this. 
A true confession. Not this flippant, watered down. I mean, we can condemn the Catholics all day for te ego te absolvo, but what about, oh, Father, forgive me for my sin? What about, oh, uh, it's under the blood, it's all right, it's already paid for? That attitude is pervasive throughout all of Christianity. It's all under the blood. He's already paid for it at Calvary's cross. We say this is true, but does that give me permission to just go on out there and do what I want? No, listen to this statement. Their true confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins. They may, they may be of such a nature as to be brought before God only. They may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who have suffered injury through them. Or they may be of a public character and should then be as publicly confessed. But all confession should be definite and to the point, acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty. Now, you can't do that without the Holy Spirit. You can't do that without chapter 3, Steps to Christ, Repentance. If you've come to him and accepted him and then conviction's going to come, then he's going to show up with, okay, here's where we're going to start working. Like David, I'm going to send a parable to you. Has God been sending parables in your life that you're not reading yet? Because he wants you to specifically be aware of that thing in your life that is hurting you, others, and him. True confession is the acknowledgement that I see that now. Right? I mean, when I come to Mary sometimes and I know she's mad at me and I just say, honey, I'm sorry. That don't mean a thing because I remember the time she said, sorry for what? <laughs> um, don't dare say because you're mad at me. <laughs> well, uh, you don't know, do you? Ah. <sighs> We do this to God all day long. God's like, I want you to know. Mary wants me to know, not because she's trying to get her pound of flesh. She wants me to know, so I'll stop doing it. We'll quit fighting, and we'll have a good marriage. And God's the same way. you got to know so I can heal you and heal your relationships with those around you. This is why the church is in such a sad state of affairs in this world, and... In any church, and especially our church, right? I mean, come on, a church this size, on some Sabbaths when we're really loaded in here, we got visitors and people, you are going to mess up and bump into people and upset somebody. You're going to say something or do something that hurts somebody. Intentionally, unintentionally, maybe the issue is with them. It is impossible not to. But when there is a lack of this idea of confession of brother to sister, Churches harbor, people harbor, families harbor, and sin just gets harbored and hurt, gets harbored over and over and covered up and covered up and covered up until you come into a church and you say, man, that place is toxic. You're going to mess up. To err is human, we say, right? But to forgive is divine, and confession is the symbol, the outward sign that you have forgiven. When there is little confession going on, it... Among brothers and sisters, you can bet there's real little repentance. Because the easy thing to do, and the most, the most I mean, like, we just don't want no confrontation no more. I shouldn't have said it. I'm just going to let it go. I do this all the time. I, I just don't want no more confrontation. I shouldn't have done that. I know they're mad at me. And then I avoid. This is like one of the things I just can't help myself from doing at times. And then it just gets worse. Well, the pastor don't like me. He didn't want to talk to me. No, I'm just trying to avoid you because I know you're upset with me. That's not what you do. I know you're upset with me. I know you didn't like the decision that I, that I was behind or that I made. Or maybe you didn't like this next decision I'm going to do. But the worst thing I can do is avoid. The very thing that I need to do is come to you and say, Hey, uh, you know, even if I didn't do something wrong, there should be that attitude of this willingness to confess. And say, Hey, let's talk. What's going on? I, I'm sorry that you're offended or that you're upset. Or maybe I did do something. Maybe I said something dumb at the board meeting and you were offended. Confession is the way to heal that and get rid of it instantaneously, Right? This is what characterizes a real relationship with Christ. But unless you're having real biblical repentance, you don't even know you hurt people half the time. Without confession, your repentance is a sham, it's fake, it's unreal, and it doesn't, it has no count. 
Confession must be from the heart. So how do you know that confession is genuine? How do you know? So if I do go to someone and say, hey, look, I'm sorry. How do you know if that's genuine? Listen to this. Confession will not be acceptable to God. This is back to Steps to Christ, chapter 4. Without sincere repentance and reformation. See, because there's the other side of this coin. you got somebody that's always saying, hey, man, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. And they turn right around and do it again. There must be decided changes in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. This will be the result of genuine sorrow for sin. So if I'm the other kind of guy, I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that don't want to confess. You might be the kind of person that's constantly confessed. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad, my bad. Yeah, but stop doing it, dude. <laughs> right? And they just keep on and they keep on and they keep on and they just never stop. It's because something's not happening in the heart. It's offensive to God. How many times are you going to watch the same old thing and then afterwards feel guilty and say, I'm sorry, but not really be sorry? Unless there's real revival, real repentance, real reformation, confession is fake. So it's just one of these things that, hey, pay attention to this in your life. So today I think maybe it's a good time to just kind of stop and ponder, am I confessing? When is the last time you specifically went to God and confessed particular sin? That's all I want to do today is ask you that. When is the last time you went to a person and particularly now that doesn't mean that we're all offending one another. Maybe you haven't. But if you have, when's the last person you've come to and put the hand out and said, look, man, sorry, that really was stupid. These are the kind of things chapter four steps to Christ is bringing out. This is the kind of things the gospel wants us to consider and say, hey, this is real gospel business. You got a fractured relationship with yourself or with someone else or with God or a parent, a family member. And the worst kind of people or the easiest kind of people that we can justify not making up with is in-laws, daughter-in-laws, son-in-laws, mother-in-laws, brother-in-laws. Well, they're the easiest to say, Mm -mm. they're the ones that God's probably looking the most at me to say, hey, and we're going to look at why God wants us in our, some of our closing statements, why God wants us to get this stuff right. We'll save that for last. Now, the chapter begins to move into a section that explains why confession is important to us. In the eighth paragraph of this chapter, why, in really the genius of confession, God knows what's going on in us. Listen to this. When sin has deadened the moral perceptions... The wrongdoer does not discern the defects of his character nor realize the enormity of the evil he has committed. And unless he yields to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, he remains in partial blindness to his sin. His confessions are not sincere and in earnest. To every acknowledgment of his guilt, he adds an apology and excuse of his course, declaring that if it had not been for certain circumstances, he would not have done this or that for which he is reproved. Confession of sin begins... A process of awakening the dead sensibilities. Isn't that it's nice? Most of us have dead sensibilities. If you've been married for 30 or 40 years, you might have some dead sensibilities towards your wife or husband. You might have some dead sensibilities to friends you've had in this church for years and years and years or acquaintances or just people that you've been. I mean, it, it can happen. We can just get so used to that person and we're just really not in, in tune with what we've done or what we're saying or even with God. And so confession begins to awaken something in us. And we say, well, it's easy. It's easy to confess to God under conviction, but it is really hard to confess to someone else. I, I, I had an experience with one of my sister-in-laws. I won't tell you which one. <laughs> one of my sister-in-laws one day was talking some stuff. I don't think she knew what she was talking about, but we got into this back and forth, and then I just cut her quickly. I was like, wait a minute. How do you think that you can be saved? You're blatantly doing X, Y, and Z consistently in your life. It's out there for everyone to see. How, how can you dare say you're good with God? Well, that was a wrong thing to say because she's like a bear. She's tough, and she, boy, she let me have, well, how, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And then the whole family got in this big argument, and then I told them some more, and I threw out some scriptures, and then I said, look, look, 
Little bro, I'm out of here, man. I'm gone. I walked off. I got in my car. I drove home. I felt good. Her blood's not on my hands. Someone needed to finally tell her. So I'm stomping around outside, and I told my mom. I said, man, mom, I just had to tell her. And she's like, ooh, damn it. I was like, well, someone, it's just not true what she was saying. And I'm going on, and then I'm, I'm talking to God out th- that night in the pasture, and I clearly hear this impression. You thought that was a good idea to tell her she's going to hell when she don't even know the gospel. You really thought that was good? Well, well no. Huh, I don't know. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. It was stupid. You know, I got a big mouth sometimes and get riled up. And the guy's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good now. You confess it to me. Now go tell her. I know what she's going to do. Lord, she's not a Christian. She's going to tear me to bed. There's no way. I don't even want to go see her. Go. You got to make that right. You shouldn't have done it. You know that was wrong. You're a preacher for crying out loud. So then I'm grimaced thinking, Lord, she's not. I know what's going to happen when I get there. And sure enough, I show up under terrible conviction. I've got to get this right with her because I can't go preach Sabbath with this on my head. That's the bad thing about being a preacher. I cannot let sin hang out for more than six days. Because <laughs> you'll know it if I stand up here and preach. So I always got to tell Mary, that's not fair, because you know I got to, <laughs> but I've got to get it right. So I go get it right. And what happens? She eviscerates me. She lords it over me. I, you shouldn't have done you right. Who you think you are? You, and it was an a, a humbling experience. But the point was, it wasn't about whether she's going to receive it or not. It's like, God's like, you got to go make that right with her. In fact, James 5 verse 16 says, right? Confess your sins to God and your faults to one another. And it's making that differentiation that I don't go to a priest to confess my sins. I go to God to confess my sins. But if I've offended a brother, I go to him with the faults. And I say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I shouldn't have done that. In fact, Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 24 says, don't even come into my house and try to have a relationship with me if you don't have one with your brother. Leave your gift at the altar and go make things right with him because if you're out with him, you're not right with me, even though you haven't offended me. But you have offended me. Right? Remember what Psalm 51 says. David says, Lord, uh, for against you alone have I sinned. So he recognized that sin against a brother and a sister, man, is serious business. But now I want to warn you something. Do not be careful because in this chapter she says, uh, if it's not public, don't make it public. In other words, there's some things you probably shouldn't confess if they don't know it. There's some things that, that maybe your wife or your husband does not know and the confession is only to relieve a guilty conscience and will do nothing but hurt that person. I gave a very similar sermon to this when I was in Ketchum, Oklahoma, talking about confession, confession, and then because this church was terribly torn up, it, it, uh, there, there was these huge factions in the church, the families were fighting. And I had this sermon, and I said, you have, we went over this kind of confession idea, and at the end of the service, man, people got up, and they were, you know, people were, were hugging and, and confessing, and then Dave Churchill, one of our elders, came up to the front and said, Pastor, I just want to, I just got to confess of what I said about you. And then he went off about all the things he said about it. It was like, psh, 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 psh. <laughs> I don't need to know that. No one else needs to know that. So some things I'm saying with confession, be be smart about, because sometimes your confession is going to hurt even worse. If they don't know and there's been no hurt, keep, that's what Ellen White means, keep that between you and God. Now I'm saying you need to make that an object of prayer because every situation is different. But truly what we're talking about, confession, when someone knows that you have hurt them, you must make things right. So when the boss bites... When someone hurts us, when someone lies on us or does us wrong at home, the workplace, when something happens in life and we just break under the load and mess up, do not pretend like it didn't happen and because nothing's being said and go on your way. You're crippling your relationship with God. You are absolutely messing up. And confession is God's way of saying, hey, I will take that. I will relieve you of that. You're damaging yourself. You don't even know it and you've damaged someone else. And so confession is... 
is, is very important because that's when, when we talked about that in Steps to Christ chapter 3. Then the virtue from Christ comes forth. Then you see his character. You see his righteousness. You see him saying, Father, forgive them for, for they know not what they do. He's, he's confessing sins. It's not his to confess. And he's our example. He's our righteous example in all things. So it's okay if you know I didn't do nothing to this person. They're just a sensitive soul. It's okay then, like Jesus, to go and say, hey, man, I want to make things right. I probably am, I did something that I shouldn't. Sometimes you have to, to lower yourself. Now, I know people got the attitude, well, I ain't doing that. They, they need to learn their lesson. Yeah, so do you. Sometimes that... that mouth that constantly wants to correct and criticize and, and judge is our biggest enemy. And we hurt people with it. Christ is the example in all things, and he did not say one unnecessary censorious word. He did not hurt anyone with his words. And so if you've done that in your life, maybe confession. There's somebody that you need to go make things right with. And then you can make it right with God. If a person isn't willing to receive it, that's not between you and him. It's between God and them. Matthew 7, verse 2, right? It says, for what judgment you mete out is what judgment is going to be used against you. So if someone doesn't want to forgive you, they don't want to accept it, and you go to stick the hand out and they won't shake it, or you go to hug them, they push back, or you go say, hey, brother, I shouldn't have done that, and they say, yeah, you shouldn't have, and walk off, you leave that to God. You walk away from there with a clean heart before the Father. He says, I will love you Amen. like David. Amen. And then you can move on in freedom Amen. and experience a fuller relationship with God. Your job is to make it right when you, when you can. In the ninth paragraph, she says this. She calls it the spirit of self-justification when people don't want to. And it began with Satan. The spirit of self-justification originated in the father of lies and has been exhibited by all the sons and daughters of Adam. Confession of this order, of this order are not inspired by the divine spirit and will not be acceptable, acceptable to God. True repentance will lead a man to bear his guilt himself and acknowledge it without deception or hypocrisy. Like the poor publican, not lifting so much as his eyes into heaven, he will cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And those who do acknowledge their guilt will be justified, for Jesus will plead his blood in behalf of the repentant soul. I think that's the safe road, right? So, so maybe the situation with you and this person is iffy who did what. But, eh, the safe road is probably to say, hey, Lord, I'm a sinner. I, there's no telling what's in me. God, forgive me, a sinner. And I'm going to go make over. That's the safe road, right? Now, our final, final example, I really want to, to spend some time here for just a second. In John chapter 21. It's our final example about, about why confession is actually, this is to me like the, the most important reason why. And I saved it for last. It's in John chapter 21. And it's the story, it's the final story of, of Peter. He, like David, had committed terrible sin. I am sure it says that he went out and he wept bitterly. He was under repentance. But there's nowhere yet a record after Calvary to this moment that he confessed it to anyone. Maybe he just thought it was going to go away. If you read the story in the book Desire of Ages is where our quote's going to come from. It's wounding Peter's heart. He's feeling like among his peers, cut off from God. He's feeling less than the rest of them. He's feeling unworthy. This sin that he did has wounded him so terribly so that it's jeopardizing his work for God. And Jesus draws him up. And you know this, but I'm not going to read this in the sense that we typically read this. I want to read it from a different point of view. Verse 15 and 17. So it says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, oh, Yeah, Lord, you, you know that I love you. This is the typical quintessential attitude that we have about sin. Oh, yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I'm okay now. Like, no one's noticing. I'm good. Like, right, all right. This is what he's doing. 
Kind of like, oh, yeah, I do, I love you. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And now comes the confession. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And like David, Jesus said to him, now I'll feed my sheep. Jesus drew out of him a confession. You would think it wasn't necessary. He, he wept bitterly in the garden. He went to the place where Jesus was taken away, and he wept on that same spot. He was brokenhearted, but the confession had to come. Christ had to draw it out of him, and it began the healing of his heart. And now, the reason why, the number one reason why we must confess, listen to this from Desire of Ages. Another lesson Christ had to give relating especially to Peter. Peter's denial of his Lord had been in shameful contrast to his former professions of loyalty. He had dishonored Christ and had incurred the distrust of his brethren. They thought he would not be allowed to take his former position among them, and he himself left, had felt that he had forfeited his trust. Before being called to take up again his apostolic work, he must before them all give evidence of his repentance. What is the evidence of repentance? Confession. Without this, his sin though repented of, might have destroyed his influence as a minister of Christ. The Savior gave him opportunity to regain the confidence of his brethren and so far as possible to remove the reproach he had brought upon the gospel. Here is given a lesson for all Christ's followers. The gospel makes no compromise with evil. It cannot excuse sin. Secret sins are to be confessed in secret to God, but for open sin, open confession is required. The reproach of the disciple's sin is cast upon Christ. It causes Satan to triumph and wavering souls to stumble. By giving proof of repentance, the disciple so far as lies in his power is to remove this reproach from Christ. It is beautiful. My sin. Think about it. How many times the worst thing I have ever heard someone say, if that is what an Adventist Christian is, I don't want to be one. I brought reproach upon the gospel. I brought reproach upon this denomination. And I brought reproach upon Christ with my sin. And confession is the way to remove that reproach from God and put it on myself where it belongs. So that people cannot say, well, well that is what a Christian is. No, it is not. That is what my flesh, my fallen nature is. Christ is Christ and he's pure and I was not living like him. And I, I am sorry and I confess it before the universe that that is actually Satan's way. That I was deceived into grabbing a hold of. It removes the reproach from him when I confess. And it says, no, that is my fault. It is not my Lord's. It is not God's way. It is not the gospel. It is not Christianity. And it is surely not what being a Seventh-day Adventist is. That's why we confess. We own it, but then he pays for it. That is why, friends, we must, we must confess. Our Father in heaven, we all need to take this topic seriously. For we are wounded in our own hearts over unrepented of and unconfessed sin. We've hurt ourselves. We have all kind of psychological baggage from it that psychiatrists and psychologists and drugs and medicine and self-helps can't do a thing for. We've wounded others that suffer and hurt because of what we have said and done. And above all, we have thrown a reproach upon your kingdom that you are not worthy to bear. God, forgive us and lead us into particular confessions that we may remove that reproach from you, find healing for ourselves, and like David, a renewed relationship with you. 
And Father, we ask for a rich blessing to be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.